In the previous video, we talked about some properties of the Z-transform. We figured out that it was a linear transform. We looked at what happened when you did time reversal in the time domain. We looked at the time shift theorem. We also looked at what happened when you multiplied a discrete time signal x of k by an exponential sequence alpha to the k. We saw what happened in the z domain for that operation. We're going to continue doing similar things. In this video, we want to look at certain properties of the z-transform. So we're going to look at the convolution property, the um, differentiation property, the initial value theorem, the final value theorem, some other properties related to the z-transform. So this chart right here states the convolution property. And the convolution property is a very useful one. This is one of the big reasons why we like the z-transform. It says that if we have the convolution of x of k and y of k in the time domain, in the z-domain, that is simply multiplication of their respective z-transforms. So that's one reason we really like transform domain methods. We don't have to do convolution. In terms of the region of convergence, remember Rx is the region of convergence of x of z, and Ry is the region of convergence of y of z. When we do this operation in general, we end up with a transform x of z times y of z whose combined region of convergence for this whole um, product is the intersection of Rx and Ry. So in general, taking our intersection, like we said in the last video, makes this resulting region of convergence smaller unless pole zero cancellation occurs. Again, we'll get to pole cancellation here in an example towards the end of this sequence of videos, but in general, the region of convergence is going to get smaller if this does not occur. What about z-domain differentiation? We can think of this as multiplying in time by k means multiplying by a negative z of the derivative of x of z. So if I multiply in the time domain by k, that means perform this operation in the z domain. The region of convergence actually remains completely unchanged in this case. So it doesn't change the region of convergence. So if you already know what the z-transform of x of k is, and you want to know what the z-transform of k times x of k is, all you need to do is do some basic calculus, take the derivative of x of z, and then multiply by a negative z. The initial value theorem says that I can figure out the first value of my discrete time signal in the time domain by simply taking the limit as z goes to infinity of my z-transform. So that's very interesting. We'll actually go ahead and let's, let's prove that one right here. We haven't proven many of these properties because many of these properties are proven in the exact same way as we established the corresponding Fourier discrete time Fourier transform property. So we didn't do a lot of those proofs, but we didn't do any type of initial value theorem property for the discrete time Fourier transform. Let's go ahead and actually prove this one. So the claim is, is if we take the limit as z goes to infinity of x of z, we should get out x of 0. So it's actually very easy to see just by the definition. So the limit as z goes to infinity of x of z is the same thing as the limit as z goes to infinity of this sum right here because this is x of z. For this property I am assuming that x of k is a right-sided signal. So it's a signal that is 0 for time k equals negative 1, negative 2, all the way back to time minus infinity. So my sum right here, sum right here starts at 0 and goes to infinity. If I actually write out what this summation is, instead of writing it in compact notation like this, actually writing out all the terms, the first term is x of 0 times z to the 0, which is 1, so I just get x of 0, plus x of 1 times z to the minus 1, which is the same thing as x of 1 over z, plus x of 2 over z squared, plus dot, 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 forever. In the limit, as z goes to infinity, this term goes to 0, this term goes to 0, all these terms go to 0, and I'm left simply with x of 0. Often when given x of z and we want to go back to the time domain we want to know the signal for all time k. If however you're asked to find just this value this is a much simpler way to do it. Just take the limit as z goes to infinity and this one value that you're looking for pops out essentially and we showed why that's the case right here. There's a similar proof for the final value theorem. So the final value theorem says I can compute kind of the asymptotic value of my discrete time signal, the limit as n goes to infinity of x of n, by performing this limit operation right here. So take my z transform x of z, 
multiply it by z minus 1 and take the limit of this product as z goes to 1. If you want to write this out, you can do a similar proof and actually kind of get something out. We're not going to do it, but it's akin to what we showed on the previous slide. The difference is this lets us get kind of the final value of our signal. If x of n is kind of asymptotically approaching 0 or approaching some quantity, we can easily compute it using z domain information only. We don't actually have to go back to the time domain at all. We just compute it directly using this limit. So that concludes kind of the uh, list of properties that we wanted to talk about. What we're going to do now in the next three videos is we're going to work through three different examples. The first example is going to talk about this pole zero cancellation phenomena that I have mentioned several times now. It's going to give a concrete example of what that looks like and how the region of convergence changes when pole zero cancellation occurs. And then the two videos after that, each one of those videos is going to be given a discrete time signal x of k, find the z transform. But instead of doing the kind of pure definition calculation, we're going to use a variety of the properties that we've talked about in the preceding video and in this video.